All right. In um, this next group of videos, I want to spend some time talking about the peripheral nervous system, uh, some general aspects of it. And essentially, the topics I'd like to cover in the next couple of videos, I'm not going to get all of these, but in this video, I'm going to be going over sensory receptors, properties of receptors, classifications of receptors, and I may get into processing if time permits. I probably won't. So in the next video after this, I will more than likely be doing some basics about processing and then pain. And then I want to spend one more video going over the basic nerve, the basic nerve, basic anatomy of a spinal nerve and some reflex physiology. Okay, not reflexology, that stuff's a little goofy, but uh, I'm talking the actual real science and physiology behind um, how a reflex works. Okay, so like I said, in this video, I'll more than likely be covering these first three bullets here sensory receptors, property of receptors, and classifications. Okay, so. Let's get going. Uh, the peripheral nervous system, bear in mind, is essentially all of the neural structures outside of the brain. Okay, And the major structures that you find outside the brain are sensory receptors, peripheral nerves and their associated ganglia, and motor endings. Okay, So essentially sensory, you know, sensory receptors, sensory neurons, peripheral nerves either going into or out of the spinal cord, and then motor endings um, synapsing with target tissues. Okay, and like I said, in this video, we'll primarily be going over sensory receptors. All right, so, and then remember in the, in the previous video when I, uh, uh, the one titled Introduction to the Nervous System, I broke down the different divisions of the peripheral nervous system, you know, from the voluntary aspects to the involuntary aspects to the visceral versus the motor aspects. Okay, you know, I would, I would go back and review that. Um, you know, make sure you understand that uh, that video before you come back to this one. Okay, so something to keep in mind. Now, sensory receptors. What these are? Is what sensory receptors are? They're structures that are found in, I mean, everywhere within the body that are specialized to respond to changes in the environment. And those changes in the environment are what we call stimuli. Okay, so a stimulus is a change in the environment. And there, I mean, we could sit here for and we could sit here for a half hour and just list various modalities of stimuli, you know, from changes in our blood chemistry and pH, changes in our uh, blood pressure, changes in our muscle tension, all right, changes in our overall body position changes in temperature, okay, and so on, okay, all of these would be considered stimuli. These are all, uh, these are all aspects about our environment that are always changing because you have to remember that we're a very metabolically active organism and our physiology adapts to whatever we're, basically whatever stress we're applying to our physiology, all right, whether it's, you know, and, you know whether it's um, changes from the external environment or changes in the internal environment, we have to be able to to adapt and respond, not just, uh, I shouldn't say adapt, we have to be able to detect and respond to stimuli. So detection and response are quite important. Okay, the, you know, detection and response are quite important when it comes to stimuli because if we don't, okay, if we start to lose our ability to use these receptors in the brain or at whatever level of processing that takes place to not only detect but respond to these stimuli, then we're going to start to see some problems. You know, for example, blood pressure. Okay, over time, we may, we, we have hard times regulating our blood pressure, and there's various modalities as to why. Okay, but if we start to lose our ability to, um, to properly respond and compensate for these stimuli, then that's when we're going to need medical intervention. Okay, so basically being able to sense and adapt to your environment is quite important. If you don't, you are going to need more help than what your body can do, hence medical intervention. Okay, and, um, you know, basically these receptors are activated as a result of graded potentials. Remember, we talked about those in the active potential video and described graded potentials as essentially just local irritations. Okay, as local irritations. Okay, and... Um, and like I said, you know, there are these graded potentials may not necessarily always activate an action potential, but 
if they are strong enough, that sensory neuron will start generating action potentials from the nerve to the central nervous system, and then we'll have to figure out what that stimulus is and carry out the appropriate response. All right. And then the last, uh, you know, another important feature, not necessarily of sensory receptors, but of the brain itself is perception. Okay, sensation, basically being aware of a stimulus and perception. So sensation is just being aware. Perception is the interpretation of the stimulus. Okay, so realistically, both of these are occurring as a result of the brain. Okay, and there are specific pathways that sensory receptors get information from the periphery of our body up to the brain itself. All right and for the purpose of sensation and awareness. Now, not, so basically not, I mean, for example, not all of this is going to be conscious though. For example, blood pressure, okay? Blood pressure, I mean, you not, you're not gonna feel your blood pressure going up and down, okay? That's why blood pressure is nicknamed the silent killer, all right? Because there are just certain stimuli you really can't feel, all right? So, I mean, so bear in mind that not all aspects of, of sensory reception is conscious, okay? but but the ability to regulate this, whether it's conscious or unconscious, is to regulate stimuli is important. All right, so sensation awareness. Receptors are the beginning of allowing us to sense and perceive information about our environments, okay? Now, sensory receptors have certain properties, and you notice some very sim some similarities in the properties uh, of these, you know, because remember, these are excitable tissues, you know, remember, these are just basically specialized nerve endings associated with, you know, axons, and, you know, they're excitable tissues just like muscle tissue, so there is um, you know, so basically they're excitable tissues. Now, a little bit, you know, so, so, one, so one common denominator here is receptor potential, okay? Receptors have a resting membrane potential just like any other cell, and they are excitable tissues, okay? And basically they are sensitive to various stimuli. Okay, they're they're sensitive to various stimuli. So, certain now one thing to bear in mind, um, one thing to bear in mind about though these local irritations that receptors are specific. Okay, receptors are specific. For example, let's say there's a receptor that's designed to detect changes in blood pressure. Okay, that same receptor is not gonna be sensitive to changes in you know to in pH or in changes to I don't know temperature. All right. So these, so these, these pressure receptors, specifically for blood pressure, are you know the the stimulus of pressure, mechanical pressure, is what's going to set those off. Okay, not really pH or temperature. So that's something to kind of keep in mind. Receptors are specific. All right, but they're like any other excitable nervous tissue. They're excitable cells, and you by now should have an understanding of what that means. Okay. Now, if we want to, if you want to describe a receptor, we would call a receptor a transducer. Okay, we would call we would call them transducers. So what I'm saying here with transduction is we're converting one form of energy into another. Okay, the another in this situation is an electro chemical, basically an electrochemical action potential. Sorry, my marker's going a little crazy on me. Okay, so electrochemical energy. All right, so then basically we're converting one form of energy into another. So for example, let's say there's a mechanical receptor. Now when you see the word, I'll, I'll go over this more in depth in a second, but let's say, this, let's say this receptor is very sensitive to changes in its mechanics, meaning essentially pressure. So if you apply pressure to this nerve and you displace the cell membrane of this, that might cause the opening of sodium gates. All right, and then you'll generate an action potential if the stimulus is strong enough, okay? So you took a mechanical force, and then you turn that into an action potential, an electrochemical, um, an electrochemical form of energy, okay? Vision, okay? Vision is basically photo energy, you know, photon energy, 
All right, so basically light radiation is one form of energy. It comes in contact with the receptors of your eye, the cones and the rods, and then you generate that, you know, and then basically you turn that into an, ele an electrochemical signal. Because remember, nerves send electrical impulses down their axons, and then once the impulses get down to the axons, then you release neurotransmitter. Okay, that's how nerves communicate. Remember, that's the purpose of action potentials. Okay, uh, you know, I mean, a, a change in chemistry. Okay, you know, a change in pH. All right, may be enough to irritate a receptor, and then you'll generate an action potential. You guys are getting the picture here of what a transducer does. You know, we're taking one form of energy and converting it into another. Okay, so we're taking the stimulus energy and converting it into nerve energy, as stated here. Okay, so that's a very important property of nerves. And like I said before, that when it comes to sensory transduction, the, the, the sensory receptors are very specific to the stimuli. Okay. And one more important feature I'm going to talk about a little later is adaptation. Sensory receptors adapt, okay, to constant stimuli, all right, which is important because, you know, this allows us to... You know, the, the rate of adaptation with receptors can influence, um, you know, many different, many different things in terms of body position to, um, you know, some receptors adapt very quickly, some adapt very slowly, and, but the result is this, this allows us to be very, very perceptive to a wide array of different stimuli. Okay, and the other reason adaptation is important because you have to remember that we're talking about generating an action potential here. We're talking about a, a nerve cell opening up sodium gates and potassium gates, okay, and basically changing its, its membrane potential and the energy of that cell. Okay, if we overstimulate that cell and it, and it does not adapt in a timely manner, that cell could, be, could become non-functional and even damaged. Okay, so adaptation is important at the receptor and the perception level. It's important in all rounds. But I'll talk more about adaptation later on. Okay, so these are the major properties of sensory receptors you have to understand. And let's talk about the different ways we can classify receptors, okay? Basically, there are three ways we can classify receptors. By their location, by their modality, and by their structural complexity. And we're going to kind of break each of those down individually, okay? So let's talk about location first, all right? The first group of receptors, uh, extraceptors and then interoceptors, and then there's another one out there that's kind of a little different. These are technically interoceptors, but your book brings them up, so I'm going to bring them up. Proprioceptors, okay? Now, I mean, this is just basic terminology here. Extero, I mean, that's pretty obvious, external. Okay, so obviously these are receptors that are responding to stimuli arising from outside of the body, okay? And here's just a few of them listed, you know, touch, Touch and pressure are essentially the same thing. Pain, temperature, okay? Pain is essentially extreme temperature or extreme pressure, all right? But these are all stimuli that can, that, that can potentially arise from outside of the body, okay? And that's all extraceptors are doing, okay? They're, they're designed to detect changes in the outside of the body. So think about this now for a second. Where would these be located? Where would these extraceptors be located in the body in order to detect these various stimuli that we just mentioned? Touch, pressure, pain, and temperature. Think about this for a second. Where would the, where, what, what organs or what tissues in the body would you find these in? Well, I take a drink of tea. If you guess skin, you were correct. Okay, so these, so if we're detecting changes to the outside of the body, these have to be very peripheral type receptors, okay, external, close to the external environment, all right? So most of these receptors are found within the skin. Some of them may be found in muscles and joints, but those are still very peripheral tissue, skeletal muscles, I mean, peripheral tissues as well, all right? So if you want to, you know, if someone touches you, that's, a, that's an extraceptor in your skin detecting that touch, you know, the pressure from the touch. Same thing with pain and temperature. So that's something to keep in mind. Okay, and these are the most specialized organs as well, some of these. Like, for example, you think about the eyes. You know, those are very, very, um, you know, the eyes or the ears. Those are what we call the special sense organs. All right. So something to think about. 
and then there are more simple ones as well. I mean, you know, it's not just eyes and ears. I mean, like I said, if you think about all the different types of receptors in your skin and so on, all right, you get the picture. Now, interoceptors, okay, intero, again, just basic terminology, you're going to think internal. Okay, you're going to think internal. Okay, and these internal receptors are basically what another word for them are visceroceptors. Okay, so remember when you see the word viscera, you should think your internal organs. Internal organs. Okay. Sorry, folks, I know I pause sometimes, but I just sometimes I can't write and talk at the same time. So, um,. So interoceptors, visceroceptors. So essentially, these are receptors that are going to be found not necessarily with, within, the in, uh, within the internal viscera, but these are going to be more within the connective tissue that's associated with these. Okay, because remember, most of your organs are encapsulated. Okay, most of these organs are encapsulated, so these would be found in capsules. All right, these would be found in capsules associated with organs. Okay, so whenever you feel visceral pain, okay, that's typically where that's coming from is the connective tissue associated with that, um, with that organ has been stretched or damaged of some sort. Okay, now, I mean, don't get me wrong. There are receptors inside the organs as well, but that's when you think of, I mean, I mean, you got to think about this. Whenever you feel... Whenever you feel an internal organ, I mean, you always feel pain with it, okay? And that's, you know, that's typically where those are, okay? And again, these are sensitive to chemistry changes, you know, because remember, there's a lot of chemistry going on inside the body with our metabolism, tissue stretch, and temperature changes, so, all right? And then proprioceptors, pro, the, the, the concept of proprioception... Okay, proprioception is essentially an awareness of your position in space. Oops. Okay, so essentially spatial awareness, okay, awareness of your body position. So basically there are certain types of receptors that are found specifically within muscles, tendons, joints, and ligaments that all work together okay, that are constantly telling you, that are, uh, when I say telling you, I mean telling your brain, okay, how much muscle tension is, is being applied to a tendon, how much muscle ten tension is actually being applied to the muscle itself, how much pulling and stretching is there going on, so we can basically, you know, create the right muscle contractions to maintain body position. That's essentially what proprioceptors are, and I'm not really going to go terribly in depth with these, but just like I said, I'm really only bringing this up because your book is talks about them separately, all right? So extraceptors, interoceptors, and proprioceptors. So proprioceptors, think, you know, muscles, joints, and tendons, muscles, joints, and tendons, and ligaments. Extraceptors, essentially receptors in your skin or the very periphery. And then interoceptors, um, receptors that are associated with your organs, and more specifically, the connective tissue capsules of your organs, all right? So by location, okay, probably the most common, oh, God, dang it. Probably the most common modality of um, classifying receptors is going to be through, well, modality. Uh, modality, okay? So when we say modality, we're saying type, okay, stimulus type. Okay, stimulus type, all right? So basically, the, you know, one type of receptor out there is what's called the mechanoreceptor, okay? Mechanoreceptors are, re are receptors that are sensitive to touch, pressure, vibration, stretching, and itching, okay? So where do you think, I mean, right now you should already be getting the picture of where you think uh, most of these uh, mechanoreceptors are going to be located. These are going to be more peripheral type receptors towards your skin, okay? Um, you know, skin and in your, not just in your skin, but in, in the connective tissue capsules of organs as well. These are very widely distributed receptors, okay? So essentially... Um, so when you feel touch, that's basically when you mechanically alter the properties of that receptor. Okay, and I'm going to talk about this in a little bit, the, what's called the Pacinian corpuscle. Okay, probably the most well-studied type of sensory receptor out there. That's a, that's a, that's a type of mechanoreceptor. All right. And then there are thermoreceptors. Okay, thermoreceptors. 
Okay, thermo meaning, you know, temperature. So these are obviously temperature receptors, all right? So these are, you know, so basically whenever uh, body, so whenever our body temperature changes, you know, for example, the, you know, some of these may be in the, you know, within the brain themselves, okay, because when blood, as you're, as you're circulating blood to the brain and, you're, and your core body temperature starts to cool, your blood temperature is going to start to cool, and then you need to carry out an, a specific response, i.e. shivering, okay, or if you touch a cold object, there's a lot of thermoreceptors in your skin as well. So thermoreceptors are sensitive to changes in temperature. Photoreceptors, okay, when you think photo, you should think light. Okay, light. So basically UV radiation. Okay, and then now a specific spectrum of UV radiation. All right. And there's only one area that these are located in, and that's going to be in the retina. Okay, it's going to be the retina of the eyeball. The eyes are the only spot where these are located. Okay. What's interesting is a lizard called the tuatara. They say that tuataras have what's called a third eye. So what they it's not technically a third eyeball, but on their forehead there's this there's an extra patch of there's an extra patch of photoreceptors on their forehead. And basically this makes them more you know, and, and it's, so it's a it's a cluster of, of photoreceptors. And it makes them more sensitive to changes in light throughout the day. So they're kinda, you know, go research this and read about this a little bit. I'm not gonna talk much about it because I want you guys to kind of get curious and go take a look at that. But read about the two Atara and their third eye. It's kind of interesting. Okay, and then chemoreceptors. Okay, these are extremely important receptors because these allow us to basically properly maintain everything from metabolism to taste to blood chemistry. Okay, but chemoreceptors are basically sensitive to changes in your body chemistry. Okay, so changes in, so basically, now, not just chemistry, but chemicals as well. Okay, you got to remember, when you smell and taste something, those are actual molecules that are coming in contact with receptors. So if you smell something in the air, you're smelling a molecule in the air that came in contact with a receptor. Okay, if you taste something, same thing. A molecule from a piece of food came in contact with a taste bud, and you are saying, wow, this tastes like pizza, or this tastes like, uh, I don't know, chow mein, whatever it is you're eating. All right. And then also changes in chemistry. So essentially when we're saying blood chemistry, we're really saying pH. Okay, changes in pH. All right, we're very sensitive to changes in pH because bear in mind that changes in pH can greatly affect our metabolism and our ability to circulate oxygen throughout the body. Okay, and then there are nociceptors. Um, nociceptors, what these are, these are specialized free nerve endings that are sensitive to basically pain. So these are what we call pain receptors. Okay, now nociceptors are sensitive to basically extreme temperature and extreme pressure okay and also in certain situations there are chemicals that can make nociceptors more sensitive for example if you're walking around the the the, the house at night and you're not paying attention or you're half asleep or both and your shin says hello to the coffee table and you know you, you feel that bump down there that's inflammation and then that bump it hurts to the touch a little bit because there are certain chemicals that are released to increase the sensitivity of these basically it's your body's way of saying leave this area alone so it can heal okay so and and nociceptors we're going to come back and talk about these a little more in depth when I talk about pain in the next video. But these are essentially found in the skin and in connective tissue capsules. Okay, so that's something to think about with nociceptors. They're pain receptors. So modality, mechano, thermo, photo, um, chemo, and then nociceptors. All right. And then another way we can take a look at the sensory receptors of the body is through structural complexity. And really there's two classes of this. There's either what we call special sense organs that are complex, or there are more simple receptors that aren't as complex. Okay, so these complex receptors, what these essentially are, these are, re these are essentially receptors that are embedded within epithelial tissue, epithelial or lots of specialized connective tissue, 
Okay, so for example, the I is a good example of a special sense. When you take a look at the I, right, hopefully your eyeball doesn't look like that. When you take a look at the eyeball, there are three separate tunics of the eyeball. Okay, the tunica media, the tu or uh, I'm thinking of blood vessels. The, uh, sorry, the sclera, the choroid, and the retina. Okay, the sclera, the choroid, and the retina. Okay, so there's three layers of tissue. The only part of the eye that's actually nervous system structures are the retina and cranial nerve number two, the optic nerve. Okay, everything else is just water and connective tissue. Okay, and some muscle tissue in there. Okay, so water and connective tissue. But all of these accessory connective tissues and waters and muscles make it possible for the for the nervous system aspect of the eye, the re the receptive aspect of the eye, to do what it does. Okay, start to formulate images. All right, same thing with hearing. Okay, basically you've got a group of receptors embedded within gels and water and bone, okay, within the cochlea of the ear, again, to take mechanical vibrations and turn them into audible noises. All right, and then these simple receptors can be, you know, either very encapsulated or unencapsulated, okay, but these are essentially what you think about as the somatosensory receptors, not these quite these highly specialized ones. These receptors for touch, pressure, stretch, temperature, pain, and so on, okay? So those are the ways we classify receptors by structural complexity, modality, and... Um, and basically where the stimuli, where the stimuli are coming from, they're being detected external versus internal location, sorry. Okay, so let's kind of talk a little specifically, let's kind of take all these properties and put them together and talk about probably, like I said, the one of the more well-studied um, types of receptors out there. All right, so there is a type of receptor called a, a penithean corpuscle. So what these essentially are, it's a nerve. So it's a nerve. Actually, we'll just keep this going. That is embedded within a lot of connective tissue, with, with, with the kind of a, a fluid-like tissue. And it's really cool because the tissue around here is very, very layered. There is many, many layers around this nerve ending here. Okay. And you should be thinking that there's going to be some fluid in all these layers, okay? All right. And then this would be myelinated. Okay. So let's talk about the penicillin corpuscle. So when you, when you kind of break this down, there is an area of this that is basically where there's no myelin. And that's the, basically the, the kind of the, the free ending of the receptor buried within these layers of tissue. Okay, buried within these layers of tissue. Now, what happens, this is, a, this is, this is an example of a mechanoreceptor. Okay, this is, this is a mechanoreceptor, okay, so a touch receptor, pressure receptor. So what happens when you apply pressure to this, okay, what will happen is really cool. So you apply pressure, that energy is that, that, that physical force is transferred through these, these, these encapsulated uh, layers around here, and then you cause these to deform. Okay, you cause these to deform, and then the deformity of these layers will will basically put pressure on the free nerve ending that's embedded within here. Okay, and then what will happen is that will cause some sodium gates to open. Okay, that will cause some sodium gates to open. All right, and if you get enough of these, to, so basically remember that is a graded potential. That's a graded potential. Okay. Now, bear in mind that this graded potential, if it is strong enough, if it is, if we get enough sodium in here to depolarize this cell to threshold, then we can generate an action potential. Basically, remember at the saltatory conduction of the nodes of Ranvier, 
okay, will generate a graded potential um, and start sending impulses from this receptor to our brain. And then basically this is how we're aware of, you know, essentially deep touch. Okay, deep touch. All right. You know, these have been studied a lot. This is how we've basically gained a lot of good, uh, good information about sensory receptors. Now, one thing about the, you know, one thing that's been well studied about these, these penicillin corpuscles is basically re is stimulus strength versus, um, versus the receptor potential is what they would say. So what I'm saying here is the stronger the stimulus, the stronger the action potential. All right. So now what's interesting about these is when you, in, when you initially apply, apply pressure to this, to this uh, receptor, what will happen is let's say the you know, the receptor potential goes way up, all right, and then eventually it'll more or less plateau. And then if I apply a little more pressure, then you'll see it gradually go up. See, and then if I apply a little more pressure, it'll gradually go up. Okay, so based, so the strength of the action potentials um, depends on the pressure itself. Now, what's nice about this is the beauty of this is you know of of basically increasing the strength of the potential you know, in proportion to the um, strength of the stimulus, this allows for these receptors to be very sensitive, okay? So initially, when you apply a stimulus to this, these cells get really excited, okay? But then they, they kind of plateau unless you apply even more pressure, and then you see it gradually go up. So that makes these really sensitive to a wide array of, or a wide variety of different types of, or different levels or strengths of mechanics, all right? Now, and that, now, one thing that's nice though about the about whether those those panacean corpuscles or other types of receptors is the concept of adaptation. Okay, and we want to talk about adaptation. Basically, we want to either we want to break these down into either tonic or phasic receptors. Tonic or phasic receptors. All right. Tonic or phasic. Now, let's let's go with the penicillin corpuscle again. So we got the layers around there. Okay. Now, when we're saying tonic, what we're saying here, these are slow adapting receptors. Okay, so then these would obviously be fast. Okay, those would be fast. Okay, so based on what I just described, the pan the, the panacean corpuscle are fast adapting receptors. Okay, they're fast adapting receptors. Okay, now there's two ways that this panacean corpuscle can adapt. Okay, so let's say remember all this fluid I mentioned here in these encapsulated layers. Again, uh, let's say I take a I don't know I take a glass rod uh, and I and I press on this. Okay, and then remember this is going to kind of bow inward and this fluid is going to displace. Okay, what will eventually happen is the fluid inside of here will eventually kind of redistribute and then the pressure being applied to this corpuscle will will get the will become lower, okay? So so basically from outside of the nerve cell, all right, as these as these cat encapsulated layers kind of reform themselves, that takes pressure off the nerve ending itself, okay? So that's why, you know, you know, that's why initially you see this big spike in the, in the in the potential, and you're only going to see an upward spike again if you apply more pressure and make these kind of this fluid redistribute and the capsule bend inward on here again. Okay, and the other and the other way that these that these receptors adapt is basically at the at the at the nerve level itself. Remember, we talked about the events of an action potential: sodium in, potassium out, and then the sodium potassium pump will reestablish this. Um, this equilibrium of sodium and potassium across the membrane. Okay, so tonic and phasic receptors. Okay, so basically when you think of the slow adapting receptors, some of the slow adapting receptors are those proprioceptors that we mentioned. Okay, those receptors that are found in the tendons and muscles and, 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 and ligaments and, and bones, okay, like the Golgi tendon organ. Okay, these are slow adapting, uh, and, and what, is the, what is the advantage of having these being slow adapting? I mean, we're making constant mechanical changes all the time, okay, and as a result, we need to, be, we need to have a good awareness of our body position. 
Okay, we need to have a good awareness of our body position. So these are continuously generating action potentials, okay, even at similar, at similar um, stimulus strengths to our brain. So as a result, our brain is constantly aware of muscle tension being applied on tendons and ligaments, all right? And, the, and some of these could take up to, I mean, a, a day or two to fully adapt, okay? When I say adapt, I mean stop firing. All right. Whereas these phasic receptors, like these, um, like these uh, panacea and corpuscles I mentioned, you know, like I said, these are going to adapt almost immediately. Okay, they're going to adapt almost immediately, and you know, like I said, this will make us aware of a wide variety of stimuli strength as well. You know, that you know, like pressure and temperature and so on. Okay, so that's essentially how receptors adapt and the kind of the importance of adaptation. I know I didn't go terribly in depth with that explanation, but um, and then the last thing I wanted to mention were receptive fields. You know, bear in mind, I'm only kind of covering the nitty-gritty of all this. Okay, essentially what a receptive field is, it's basically an area where you've got a group of receptors in a certain area of skin. Okay, so then these receptors um, are going to be basically sending their input to a specific nerve. Okay, and then this area is what we call the receptive field. Okay, so for ex stupid marker. So for example, um, you, know, you remember the the compasses you use in geometry class to draw circles. Um, okay, so let's say so let's say I take this. Let's say I take this. The, the you know because on one end there would be a pencil, one end there would be a needle. Okay. Now let's say I spread this. Let's say I spread the compass outward. All right, I spread the compass outward, and I and I touch it to your skin. You're gonna feel one needle on each. You're gonna feel both needles, okay? Because you know, because so. But what you're doing is you're is you're activating two separate receptive fields, okay? Now let's say I take this and I I retract it back together, and let's say I get let's say I get it to where the needles are practically right next to each other, okay? And then I touch your skin. There's a good chance you're only going to feel one needle, okay? One needle. And the reason why is because you only you only really you 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 place both those needles within one receptive field, okay? Within one receptive field. Okay. So that's essentially, and realistically, that's all receptive fields are. Like I said, they're clusters of, of nerve cell endings, like nociceptors or pain receptors, for example. Okay. And, um, you know, like I said, that's really how you can measure these. You know, go, you know, go try this at home. You know, take, a, you know, don't stab yourselves, please. But, you know, you're going to be doing this in lab as well. But if those of you aren't, you know, doing lab stuff or just listening to this for the heck of it, you know, go home and do this. You know, take a, take a couple of needles and... You know, try to get them close enough together where it only feels like there's one needle touching, okay, on your skin. That's what receptive fields are, okay? And those are responsible for topics, um, what are called uh, summation. I'm really not going get to in, get into summation that depth. That's, um, I'm going to save that for some talks I'm going to do later on and some more advanced physiology stuff. You know, right now I'm just making videos to cover the nitty-gritty, and then I want to come back and go into some more specific topics. And I'm going to come back to temporal and spatial summation. All right, so this is just, like I said, kind of a very general overview of sensory receptors and their properties. And then uh, what I'd like to talk about next are basically general pathways. So we act. So now we've gotten to the point where we understand how we activate receptors and the various classes of receptors. Now let's talk about how that information gets to the brain so we can actually perceive what the stimulus is. And again, if you have any questions, don't hesitate to contact me.